It is time to move forward. It is time to take the inspiration of the intercultural syntheses of the first 50 years of peace and friendship modeled by Plymouth Colony and the melding of the great law of the Iroquois into the Constitution to the next level. It is time to respect, honor, and understand the American Indian point of view and way of life. It is time to welcome the visionary Indian to the table through an open-hearted and open-minded invitation to sit in council together and explore how we are going to realize the principles and ideals so treasured by the founders of this nation, by the American Indian, and by all people who dream of bringing universal liberty, equality, and justice from the realm of possibility into actualization. It is time for a third great synthesis. I believe that um, if the Indians and the white man would sit down and talk, it would be a mess better world. It has to come from the heart, from the spirit, from the mind of people of conscience. There's only one creator, which is leading us all. And that's what makes us all one. When that reconciliation catches fire, it will jump the oceans. We do have to take care of Mother Earth and clean up our ways and respect one another and love one another. That's all it takes. See the day, because it starts with you and it starts with me, and it has begun this moment, and nothing will stop it, because this sacred spirit fire wants to heal the entire human race, and it shall be done. Once we recognize the role of the American Indian in the evolution of the United States of America, the dream for humanity carried to these shores by the early settlers of New England and Virginia will be realized, that we lead the world as exemplars in liberty, justice, and equality. Until that time, the United States, like a three-legged stool missing one of its legs, is out of balance without the Native American at the table. And uh, I have known Connie since about 1990, and she has always been a way shower for me. She has uh, been dead a very quietly uh, dedicated to um, researching and shining a light on indigenous ways before just about anybody I know was doing it. And she was um, deeply involved in really um, figuring out how those ways could really influence us as a civilization to move forward by adopting, understanding the history of indigenous people and the teaching and ancestral wisdom, if we would just tap into it, we could solve a lot of the problems that we are facing. And so she's been holding this knowledge and meeting with incredible indigenous people for what, 30 some odd years. Mm -hmm. I also know that she has a family history that was uncovered of uh, family members who were on the Mayflower, who landed in Plymouth Rock, and who actually were connected with the very first Native Americans who greeted the settlers. And there's a, there's a story that no one knows. There's been a story, which I'm sure she might address, but that story now has taken a turn because that was, you know, history can, doesn't rewrite itself. It just unfolds and gets brighter and, and more complex or, um, but the pieces and what's are, uh, start to unfold. And what's happening now in this time in history, I think is there's a lot of transparency that um, information and issues that we never knew about before. The veil is being lifted. So stories, teachings, and facts that never existed um, are now 
available to us. And so Connie's going to take us on a journey with one of the clan grandmothers, uh, Grandmother Barbara, who is a Poconoke. And they will tell the real original story of uh, the birthing of the United States from its spiritual roots and its real purpose. And it's, it's a deeply moving and a story with a lot of opportunity for joy and a new pathway forward. Beautiful, Janice. Thank you so much for your introduction. And don't forget, dear Andrew, who has joined me I on know. this journey of bringing forth the peace and friendship between the pilgrims and the Indians, Native Americans for 54 years at the founding of this nation, which is so important for us to understand there was a first great synthesis between Europeans and the American Indian that gave birth to the American mind that was different from the European mind by the time the constitution and everything was drafted. And that was at the time of the second great synthesis when aspects of the great law of the Iroquois came into the constitution. And now we're on the brink of the third great synthesis now because we're opening our hearts and minds to the native people that I saw 30 years ago, I saw that it was what was next in the evolution of consciousness of humanity is that we're going to come to understand what the indigenous peoples know about the nature of the universe. And that's been my life work. And this, this founding of America story is a boots on the ground example of the role the indigenous peoples have played in the evolution of consciousness to date with a signal of what they have yet to play in the future, which is unfolding incredibly right here on enlightening our world, our way together in the, in the yesterday and today and tomorrow, what's going on thanks to Sign and, and uh, Brother Phil Lane and you bringing in the Aborigines. So it's just very exciting. So I just wanted to be sure to bring in yeah. Andrew. He can introduce himself a bit, but first, I think it would be good to bring in Barbara, Barbara Mary okay. Kerpus, who is a Poconoke clan grandmother and also a Mayflower descendant. So our ancestors, Barbara's and my ancestors were there at the signing of the mutual protection treaty in the spring of 1621 and that three day harvest celebration we now call the first Thanksgiving. So here we are, meeting heart to heart and coming forth into the world through Zoom and these forums together to say, hey, guess what? We've done it before, we can do it again and we can birth something new. So I just wanted to bring in Barbara who's full of love and kindness and sees the future. And, and wisdom. And wisdom, yeah. She sees the future. So I'd love for her to introduce herself a bit and then open with a little prayer, a small prayer to open this time. We don't have a ton of time together. So let's, um, let's just do what we can do and it'll be what it is. Mm -hmm. So Barbara, welcome. Hello everyone. Taniska, hello. <laughs> um, I'm a descendant of Massasoit's brother who is, his name is Quattaquina. And as a native person and a white person, I walk in two, I walk in two worlds. I'm also a descendant from Stephen Hopkins from the Mayflower. Um, with, these, with these two backgrounds or these two bloods running in my veins, it really, gives me a, a really good feeling in my heart that I'm at this place today with you all to share how I feel in my perspective of what's going on and what will go on in the future. Um, I believe that everything happens for a reason. I believe that our great spirit has set things up in a certain way to have the have things happen that need to happen for the future of the, of us humans, 
all humans, all races, all colors. Um, I have to, I, I have to teach, uh, being a clan mother, I have to teach my clans uh, different things. So that's what my main purpose is. And I try to teach everything with love, respect. And as much as I learn with my wisdom, I share it with whoever wants to know. Wonderful, Barbara. Could you open it with a little prayer? Sure. To bless our time together. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay, I'm, I can't light this because it will set off my fire alarm, but it's tobacco and sage and quartz from the seat. And we honor the North. We believe that the Creator sits in the North. So in our language, the North is pronounced Nanun Nanun -na Mayu, Nanu Mayu, and to the east, Wampanayu, to the south, Soanayu, and to the west, Papanayu. And a uh, great spirit, we call him Katanik. And along with his, he has a son whom we call Wetux, which we believe is Jesus. They came, Katana and Wetux came to our people to teach, uh, to teach the prayers and to teach us the laws. So we asked, Katana, our great spirit, and his son, we text, to open our minds, open our eyes, open our ears, and our hearts, that we all receive the healing vibration of love and peace that you gave to us and our fathers, for, and for our children, our elders, our veterans, and our sick. Hope. Thank you, Barbara. That's great. And I really appreciate that and opening our hearts, our minds, our eyes, our ears, so that we can hear what the great spirit has to share with us and we can walk in his ways that we hear. So what we'd like to do with this is give folks an idea of what went on in New England, in Massachusetts, at the first meeting of the Mayflower Pilgrims and the Poconoke Native people. This was in the spring of 1621. The Pilgrims had arrived in the winter in December of 1620, and half of their people died that first winter due to scurvy and what they call the general sickness because they had to wade from their shallop through the icy waters to get to land. And they were, they were housed on the Mayflower and they always had to walk through these icy waters. And so half of them died, which were two of my ancestors. And they left a, an orphan woman, girl, 18 years old named Priscilla Mullins who uh, went on to marry John Alden, the Cooper. And so here I am today, thanks to Barbara's ancestors, the Poconocets, the great Massasoit, the great sachem of the Poconocets, who was a peacemaker, who was an extraordinary man of peace, a high vibration leader. And their folks had suffered from a great pandemic two years before the pilgrims had arrived. And Andrew knows a lot about that. They call it the great dying. And so these people met in 1621 and they were a grieving people. They were a people just out of pandemic like we are in the midst of right now. So we can relate to these folks and to the gratitude they felt for each other when they met. Andrew, do you want to say a little about the, the great dying? 
I could do that. And should I introduce myself? Sure, introduce yourself and, and just something brief because, and then Barbara could <coughs> say a little about mm -hmm. it. Yes, I would like to introduce myself. And firstly, I'd like to send my greetings to grandmother Barbara, who I haven't seen for a whole month. This time, one month ago, it was full moon over Plymouth Rock and I've got photographs to prove it. And we were in Plymouth. And here we are one month later, and we're in Colorado. <clears throat> and just greetings to Rita and Nina and any of our other personal friends who are on this call. Just, yeah, and yeah. we were in Poconocet country in Rhode Island. Yeah, we were. With her folks. Yeah. And um, this is just really interesting. It's challenging. I, I, I just want to recognize that a lot of people do not believe the story that we tell, namely that there was this gem of friendship at the very beginning. The further away you get from New England, the more radical the story becomes until we start hearing about the Mayflower bringing smallpox blankets and all sorts of horrific, untrue um, history, these alternative histories and Howard Zinn says history is a matter of opinion and like your opinion doesn't matter. Oh, um, you know, I think there is a truth in history and it's important to go back as best we can 400 years ago this year to the original writings. Now we don't have the native perspective, but we do have the English perspective, which was written and published in the very early 1620s in London. So we have a lot of useful information and we can glean so much from that. And I've done a lot of that research myself. I always go to primary source material. I'm interested in what others write and what others think. However, I want to know what the eyewitnesses witnessed. Experienced, what, yeah, they, what, what their experiences what were and what their intent yeah. was behind it yeah. all and their expression. Yeah, and so I've been accused of being a white man, but look at me, I ain't white. I'm kind of pink, don't you think? <laughs> you know, so I must be some kind of mix. And um, yeah, the white parts on top here, um, Bob Marley would have called me a Q-tip. Remember that lovely racist statement? <laughs> yep. Um, I grew up in South Africa. I know something about racism. I know something about cultural differences as a result of that growing up there. It was a wonderful, I'm so grateful that I got to do that. Then 52 years ago, this Thanksgiving, I sailed across the Atlantic and landed here, chased down this girl, took a while, found her, here she is, and here we are. Okay, so what specifically? Well, just some context of the great dying, um, context of their meeting in, in uh, that spring of 1621, what they were both feeling. Yeah, I think this is, this. I have not seen this in the history at all. The feelings of the people, those two radically different cultures who met in the spring of 1621. The Mayflower folks, as Connie just re recounted, lost exactly, pretty much exactly half of their people. Imagine that. Imagine you're a hundred people, you're a community, you can depend on each other, you love each other, whatever you're gonna go through, you're gonna go through together. And then half of you die in the first three months. How do you feel? And 400 years ago this year, they meet the Poconocets who had suffered immense loss. They landed in a place called Patuxet, which is presently known as Plymouth, Massachusetts. When Captain John Smith came through in 1614, he estimated the village as having an estimated 2,000 warriors. Those would be just the men. And when the Mayflower landed, there was nobody. There were skulls among the rocks. There were unburied skeletons on the shore. Wow, wow. How did the Mayflower people feel coming ashore to that place that had those feelings? How did the survivors feel and how did they feel when they found each other, when they met? I just want to put that up. These two grieving, very um, challenged people, they were not, their sort of their security situation was very tough. Massasoit's people were down to an estimated 90, 90 warriors. Their enemies, the Narragansetts, were never touched by the plague. And by the way, it was the plague. They were never touched by the plague. They had 3,000 warriors. They could have been wiped out overnight. It would have just taken an act by their enemies, their traditional enemies there. And 
the security situation of the folks coming and in the middle of the great dying that occurred among the white folks, cutting down trees, building houses, and successfully by the end of 1621, having a vestigial village built. How extraordinary is that? And secondly, a successful harvest. And thirdly, the first Thanksgiving, a coming together with the Native American, their Native American friends who they'd known for about six months now. And I just want to use the word gratitude. We use the word thanksgiving, both the native and the European people give thanks at certain times of the year. And imagine the sheer gratitude that they must have felt in this brand new companionship, in this brand new security. It actually helped the native people to have the English who had these guns among other things. It hugely helped the English who would now have some, the first natives they get together with turn out to be their very good friends for the next half century. Big deal. Okay. Yeah. So Barbara, what are your thoughts and experiences through your people? Can somebody unmute her? There you go. There yeah, we go. Well, um, well, I guess it sounds like we all were in the same boat, but a trust thing too. Um, when we first met each other, it was uh, like people, I would be scared and I'm sure the people was both sides were scared of each other, not knowing what was going to happen, but they did. Uh, the language is very difficult to understand. I'm, I'm learning the language and it's hard to even speak it. Um, but when we, when one of our, our, our men saw the prayer that was given at the feast where they were thanking God for, for, the, for the harvest, thanking God for everything and he saw, he heard that, and he said, we do the same thing, and we do. We, we thank Katan, and we thank our great spirit for everything we have. And not only that, we also thank the animals that give up their life for us, for our clothing, for our food. We, we thank Mother Earth for the medicines and the comfort that she gives us and the water. We also have a, a song for the water that we thank the water for it, for it, for it, water is life. Um, so when we realized that we were both on the same page, but speaking different language, but it all meant the same thing. I think when we embraced each other, we felt that love and it did last for 54 years, I believe. And um, when Massasoit was sick, Winslow came to help him. He got him better with some uh, broth, some chicken, some chicken broth. That was a great thing to me. That showed me that he was very well loved by, by the pilgrims and stuff. And they wanted him to get well. They didn't want him to die. And uh, Squanto, Squanto helping to show how to plant. We, who came to us was we tux showed us how to how to plant and how to pray and all of that. And the three sisters, we have the story of the three sisters, bean squash and corn, that taught us how to plant our beans and squash and corn. Um, so what Squanto did what Samoset did by greeting the English, welcome English. I think we felt a little more comfortable. Our thing, we didn't like the gun. We didn't like the noise of the gun. And uh, that frightened us. Um, but to the English, they were celebrating him and celebrating their, their, their feast. And what happened, we came, we didn't know what was going on. 
but we had a treaty and we came to support them to see if there was a war or what was going on because I'm sure that that celebration was more intent than just going out firing off the guns like they go hunting. So we, we investigated, we came to see what was going on. We had 90 warriors to help. And then we saw it was a feast. We went out and brought back deer. My grand, my ancestor, grandfather, Kwadakent, when I brought a deer hide pouch full of popcorn and showed them how to eat popcorn. And uh, it just, it was a, I would think with the way it, I read it from my, on the pilgrim side, what they had to say about it, because that's what I read, I learned from. Um, they had teenagers that were helped. There was only four women that were doing this whole feast. And they had teenage girls that were helping. And the men were helping the men, you know, with the cooking too, I would imagine. You know, because everything had to be cooked outside, and so it, it it I see it in my mind as as a as a fun thing, and learning from each other how each other did things, and it must have been I would have loved to have been there. Um, my blood was there, but I would have liked to have been there in person just just to say I I was there, but here I am today, and I'm part of that. And that's a glorious thing, meeting Connie and Andrew and so many other beautiful people in the, in this, on this journey on what you guys are on has really enlightened my heart a lot. And my people, my people have come from, I see a change in my people, yes. <laughs> yes, that they are becoming more peaceful, more, that hardness of, of what happened there it's starting to heal their hearts are starting to heal their mind is starting to heal and for the whole world if everybody would heal and if everybody would come together and just not hang on to the all that awful stuff that happened and what we're here for what what the creator got us here for is to help one another to work with one another, to learn from one another, to share with one another, to love one another, and to help one another. That, that's what we're all in this one world all together for. That's my, that's my heart. Yes, Barbara. And my people are there too. <laughs> yes, and you're carrying forth that peacemaker energy that the Massasoit brought forth from the native people in 1621. It was an exception to the human condition then and now. What went on between these Mayflower pilgrims and the Poconokets? Because there was in fact a spiritual alignment. She just referred to that because that they heard that this thanking the, the God for everything, they, they heard the, the pilgrims describe basically their belief system and they said, hey, we believe all the same stuff you do, except the one wife thing. No one wife. <laughs> they didn't go for the one wife thing. But they said, you know, that, that person, that entity you call God, we call Ketan. And this is, I'm basically quoting Edward Winslow's report of his time with the Native people. And there's a little book called Good News from New England that one can get online at mayflowerhistory.com and you can go there yourself and read these words from the, the pilgrims and see their hearts and see the, their spirits and see their relationship with the native people. It's extraordinary. And there's another book called Mort's Relation that, 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 that outlines the first year and this good news from New England is the second year. And there, these were published at the time, they were sent to England and published at the time. So these are diaries basically. So anybody who wants to verify what Barbara and, 
and us are talking about, you can do that with source material. It's so important not to go through the interpretation of others because history is perspective. It's all perspective. What you wanna put your focus on, what you put your interpretation on. And you're hearing right now, three people who are coming from our hearts and looking at the light of what humanity has been. We can look at the darkness, we can look at the shadow and we can, we can wallow in that. Or we can look at the light and say, hey, guess what? We've done something together before. We've birthed something extraordinary. The United States of America, okay? It's a big deal. The United States, it's, it's in the throes of, of, of cleansing its shadow now. And, and we're in process. To, to realize that vision that, that came with the Mayflower Compact that the pilgrims drafted in the cabin of the Mayflower before they landed, where they, they created a civil body politic enacting equal and just laws serving the common good. Okay, this is democracy. And then they came, uh, they came and, and met the Massasoit and the Poconokets who lived from that place of of serving the common good. That's what the whole, the whole native re reality is based on sharing and serving the common good. And so there was a dream here. There was a seed planted here and there in Plymouth in 1621 with this synthesis between the native people and the pilgrims. So it's up to us, each of us to realize that dream Okay, we've got to choose it. We've got to be it. We've got to become it and open our hearts to each other and move into this third great synthesis that's happening right now. And it's just so exciting to be here with you, Barbara. Hmm, I think I'd like to say something about how I got so passionately involved in this. Pass me the book there, would you? Yeah. So aside from it, all of the other stuff, I actually created this novel that retells the story in an interesting way. And the novel contains in the appendix at the back a paper that I wrote about the pandemic that the native people of the entire Eastern seaboard of New England had gone through. There was a coastal phenomenon that wiped out between 70 and 90% of the native people at that time. What a phenomenon. And that happened in the context of a war called the Tarotines War, mm. which I've gone up to New England historians and said, tell me what you know about the Tarotines War. And they look at me and say, a what? Google it. It's there. There's tons of information on it. Yeah. There was an intertribal conflict between what we can, the people we currently call the Mi'kmaq and their neighbors to the south, the Penobscot, over control of the French fur trade. Typical human behavior where one party wants to control it, another party wants in, and they end up getting into trouble with each other. The Penobscot had allies to the south, the Massachusetts. That used to be a federation, the, the Massachusetts tribe, headed by a man named Nana Pashamut. Nana Pashamut sent warriors up to help the Penobscot and returned having killed some Tarotines, also known as the Mi'kmaq, having captured some of the women and children and brought them back to Massachusetts, bad move. Because what happens next? Here come these seafaring warriors down the coast in their high-speed birch bark canoes. The locals of Massachusetts had hollowed out logs, machines. And the guys coming down from the north had muskets that they got from the French, very tricky. And they were carrying a disease. Whoa, okay, so big deal, long story. It's in the book, you can read it. Uh, if anybody would like to follow up on that. Yeah, Andrew has, has just made some discoveries and has his, his thesis on the subject. Yeah, and had to go like all the way up to Northern Maine to really research. You can't go to Patuxent and get the whole story because those folks aren't here anymore. So how did I personally get involved in this? The first thing I remember was being at the Pequot Reservation. Connie had a friend there and we went to visit her and walking out, there were some native folks out there with their beautiful little young um, vendor booths and I picked up this one page little flyer and we got in the car and started driving and I looked at it and went wait a minute this isn't right there was a whole hypothesis or a whole sort of historical thing that I already 
And I knew so little. I already knew that was not true. Point being, there's a long history of untruth about those early days that has gone viral across the country to the point where now the Mayflower so-called pilgrims, this little group of settlers, are accused of horrific crimes against the native people they've met. And that's, you know that, it's simply not true. And yet, I would say three out of four Americans believe it is true because there's been a very successful campaign of misinformation. Sounds like contemporary politics, doesn't it? Yeah. Anyway, that's what got me involved. I said, we need to know the truth. Discover the truth and realized that I personally would like people to know more about this. So started writing and got this book done and here we are. Yeah, Andrew's very knowledgeable about the subject. <clears throat> I got led to it because I saw the similarities between the indigenous people and the Mayflower Pilgrim. I saw that spirit guided, God guided, epiphany based, creator based reality. And once people understand the allies that the native people have in the Mayflower Pilgrims, they were suffering from, the, they saw this, this reality that we had the right to relate directly to the divine, not through our church, not through a church. And the King of England said, hey, you're going to my church or you're committing treason. Well, they committed treason. They, they met secretly. They didn't go to church. They met secretly. And this is the native story. So once we really open our hearts and minds to the humanity of this and, and the bigger picture from the, from the eagle's perspective, we'll see the allies in the Mayflower Pilgrims to the native people and, and the seeking of true freedom that is our birthright. That's what the native people are holding for us is a connection to that bigger reality and, and how to walk it, how to be it, how to live in alignment with, with nature and all of creation. So Barbara, what are your thoughts? We're getting probably close to the end here. What are your thoughts on, on I saw you get uh, animated around the um, Teratines situation and uh, any other thoughts you might have in closing, actually? No, I'm, I'm just excited, uh, sort of, that Andrew knows about that because he's right. Not very many people know about the Tarantine. I have, I have my family books with all that in there. So he's right on with that. So I just like history that we were taught in school is not the true history. It's, it's somebody's, it's somebody's, his story. <laughs> It's somebody's story, what they think happened. It wasn't really necessarily what really happened. And it's actually better. What really happened is actually better than yeah. what's in those books because the books left out the Native American. They left out the heart and the spirit of what went on. Well, they t they when I went out west, I made a trip out west because I have family out in Arizona and out there. And, when I went out west to visit my family, I also went to a reservation. I went on the reservation, went to a store. They had a store and I was buying stuff in the store. And I shared with the, the owner that who I was, but this, that I was Poconoke. We never, what, who's a Poconoke? And I explained to them who I was. And they said, well, we, we thought you were all dead. You were all killed. I said, yes, history, that's what history taught you. But that isn't what happened. Some of us, my family in particular, some of us were loyal to the English. Some of us were loyal to praying Indians. And my family married into the praying Indians. They married into the English and the Scottish. They married in the other part of my, but we never left our tribe. We stayed Poconoke, but we did marry into outside of the tribe. So when it's, 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 it's just amazing how things have come about. And I, I don't know how to explain this really a whole, to, I have gifts that were handed down that I believe was told to me by medicine people that 
they were handed down to me through my ancestors. My sister, my older sister and I have these gifts. These gifts are, are uh, visions, um, some other type of gifts that we have. And we wondered where it came from. And as time went on, I was shown in visions who I am. I was shown where, where this all came from, how my gifts were given to me, by whom. Uh, my ancestors came to me and gave them to me. I saw my ancestors in a vision. Um, it, it's like going on a vision quest, but it just, it was like, I was praying one morning. I wanted, I had a glitch in my genealogy and I was praying one morning and then all of a sudden I was taken back in time in this vision and shown everything and told everything. So I, as when my tribe, my tribe was looking for the lost families of Massasoit and I was at a powwow. In the meantime, I had called Boston, telling them who I was. I was looking for my tribe, which tribe did I belong to? As it turns out, I have relatives in every band because we married in, <laughs> we married into each other. So as it turns out, I got, try, I got relatives in every band of even out of the tribe, other tribes. Yeah, we are one, huh? Yeah. <laughs> We're all yeah. one. My Hamlin, my Hamlin family, the Buckskin Apostle went out west, married into the Sioux. Yeah. Married into the uh, uh, Lakotas and Nest Perth. And then, wow. uh, yeah, so. That's amazing. Happened, it's just amazing what, how yeah. my ancestry went. Well, yeah. anyway. Yeah, and the, um, the thing is that after the King Philip's War, people probably want to know what happened, how, what fell apart. And the King Philip's War that ended this peace and friendship resulted from, for one thing, these visionary leaders, these two leaders, the Massasoit and William Bradford, who kept their people in peace and friendship for that 60, uh, well, it was 54 years, but uh, they died in their 60s. But during their lifetime, they kept the people in peace. That's what a, a visionary leader can do in a high vibration. You don't go into retribution in lower energies, but the, their, their next generation didn't have that vibration, didn't have that frequency. And the pressure of, of the, the, in 1630, the Puritans came with 20,000 people into Massachusetts Bay Colony. And that was a completely different energy from the Plymouth colony. And one, and one, everyone confuses, the, conflates the pilgrims and the massive Puritans, but it's very, very different energy and beliefs and everything else. These were the separatists, the pilgrims were the separatists. They separated from the church. The Puritans wanted to purify the church and stayed in the church. But meanwhile, the, the Connecticut colony- the Connecticut colony, the pressure on land, the, the, the natives were, were losing their land. They were selling their land, but they were losing their land. And they're like, hey, we got to stop this. So the son of Massasoit um, initiated the war called King Philip's War. He was King Philip. Oh, 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 wait, comment. wait, Connie. What? No, he went to Mount Wachusett to meet with the holy man, with the, with the, with the, well, the powers and the powers told them the powers had I told you this story that yeah. the about the turtle the snapping he turtle. The turtle and the, he had Anawan with him his Anawan was his war captain so he had Anawan with him and the turtle was asleep when when Matt uh, when uh, Metacom went up to him he did nothing when Anawan went up to him he came out and he nipped at Anawan and uh, the medicine man says, you had, there's your story, there's your answer. Your people will be rooted off of the face of the earth. And yeah, so it's all right. prophecy, it's yeah. all in the knowing. Like you said earlier, Barbara, it's all been for a purpose. It's all been, so, everything that's gone on is for humanity's evolutionary upward spiral, our consciousness and our choices. So we can choose now 
to be inspired by this first 50 years and these visionary leaders and these people who came together in their hearts for this period of time. And we can go into that frequency ourselves. Now that this pandemic has totally obliterated or to a great degree, the, the life as we've known it and the systems that were built out of, uh, out of alignment with our hearts and our spirits, we're in a position now to birth something new together. And, and take that inspiration from that origin story of this nation and take this nation into its destiny of bringing true liberty, justice, equality, and abundance. Because in a higher frequency, there's more abundance than we can fathom. That great American dream is our birthright. We can, we can do it, we can be it, but it's a whole nother, way, another energy, another frequency. So Barbara. I believe it's all gonna come to yeah, I really believe that. I don't know when, what time, what how. Uh, I'm also a Christian. I come from my tribe is Christian, so we believe in Jesus. We just call him. We tux in our language. We believe in God, who is Katana. You know, we believe that all this is gonna come about. It's been told. It's been told to us. And know. Barbara, you're playing a role a huge role in this process of bringing forth the native spirit and that two world spirit that the pilgrim and the Indian is in you, both of them. And, and that, mm -hmm. that love that's in your heart. Sometimes and forward. <laughs> and sometimes it, it goes like this. <laughs> it's old. Yeah. But it's so important, Barbara, and just bless you for coming forth. Let me say one closing sentence. Yeah. I'd just like to say one thing in closing and very directly to you, Barbara. I am so happy to see the Poconoke stepping forward because your story had been captured. I won't name any names, but you know who I'm talking about. It went off and it's a nasty version of the story and it's not true. And that yeah. became the mainstream story by some folks right there in Massachusetts. I and know. Here you are coming out and Sagamore um, William Guy, wow, and his beautiful daughter and the families that we've met. And it's tiny right now that you guys, to me, are the seed, that little tiny acorn that's going to become this mighty oak tree of the future of this country. You can play that role in there. So go take that home with you. Yeah, you? so that's up to all of us to become that tree. Each this, of us are uh, branches. Dissension from these other tribes. Uh, or other people, you know, that's okay. They're, they're still our brothers and our sisters. Right. That's how they want to roll. That's how they want to roll. <laughs> right. But uh, the truth will set you free. Yeah, you that, yeah, beautiful. The heart is opening and it's time for unity consciousness, not division and lower frequencies. So blessed be to the energies mm. on the planet that support us in coming together and being as one. And this whole Enlightening Our Way Together conference, wow. oh my gosh, it's all about coming together. It's recognizing the challenges and healing the hurts and going forward together. I mean, the indigenous people, the visionary indigenous peoples in their hearts are, are taking us to that place of oneness through being it and seeing it and knowing it and you see it and know it and we're so happy to be here with you yet again Barbara mm, and love to all love to David and everybody yeah Janice do you want to come in you and one uh, I'll, I'll say one more thing that see after King Philip's war the Poconocets were because Metacom was a Poconocet, the son of Massasoit, the peacemaker, and Metacom saw the necessity of do, starting this war. The Poconocets became persona non grata, right. and they were shot on sight. They were shipped off to the uh, mm -hmm. uh, the um, the the Barbados, West Barbados etc., West yeah, Indies. Yeah, yeah. So. So now, so they had to go underground and now they're coming forth. Welcome now back. that'd be a welcome back, that we great peacemaking you. energy. So yeah. thank you, Barbara. Beautiful. Thank you. I was just going to say that the, the veil seems to be lifting. And so a lot of darkness is being exposed and a lot of truth is being exposed. 
And what we need to do is trust more of the truth. And to that, um, I'd like to just mention that um, uh, Andrew and Connie are the authors of The Trust Frequency. There it is, right there. <laughs> the Assumptions for a New Paradigm. And, you know, it may sound a little bit airy-fairy that you need to just trust, but the wavelength of trust, the energetic field of trust, rides right along the field of truth. And it begins in the quantum field. And so what we need to do is step into that quantum field and create today from there. And that's not as difficult as it sounds because it doesn't happen in the third dimension. It happens by trusting first, which goes against, you know, uh, everything that we have been, uh, the, the linear way we have been educated. And so stepping into this new paradigm and creating the earth we want is not about trying in this frustrated rush, rush, rush American way. It really is about going with the flow as we have uh, Minu Blackburn here, who uh, is all about the miracle uh, field. And you put the trust frequency together with the miracle field that already exists. And then you add these truths that are unfolding and just be with them all and you'll see. I mean, you will see what your next step is, truly, because we all have a place in this next step. And uh, that sort of leads us right now into what is coming up next. And I uh, wish we had more time because of this story that Connie and Andrew are telling and grandmother Barbara, there's so much more depth to it and more beauty and pain. And it needs to be told, it needs to be given a global voice. And so this is, you know, the beginning of, of that. So look, look for more information coming from um, all three of them about this truth that really unveils the potential for the United States that this old model of the US is dying. And I think the model that was meant to be birthed is what's the veil, the veil, the curtain is being pulled back on what that truth for what this uh, country has the potential. So don't give up and get caught in the mire of the stuff in the government and the politics because there's a deeper truth unfolding. As an American Indian, and I look back at these days of our first history, I just think it's a shame that the Plymouth paradigm did not endure. The Plymouth paradigm, as I understand it, was based on the idea of sharing and everything was inclusive. Indians were not left out. They were part of the process and they felt free to make themselves part of the process. Wado, OCO. Hello everybody, I'm Betty, and I'm speaking to you today from Wagner, Oklahoma, on lands once governed and inhabited by early Mississippians, or the Mound Dwellers, who were in turn succeeded by Caddo's and Wichita's, and followed by Osages, who came in to hunt, and finally by government decree, the Creeks. So I'm a Cherokee hiding with the Creeks. Now, I coined the term Plymouth Paradigm in my volume entitled Bradford's Indian Book to make the point that had the example set by Plymouth in its first 50 years been allowed to continue, relations between America's indigenous people and the European immigrants would likely have been very different there would certainly be larger numbers of native populations than those we have today. To be clear, however, early relations between the Wampanoags and the English were uncertain. The Plymouthians knew from the outset that they were settling into what was obviously someone else's town site, and they were unsure about what the native reaction to their presence would eventually be. It's safe to say that they lived in a state of apprehension until a meeting with Osamican, the Massasoit, was arranged by Samoset. 
When the March meeting with Osamakan and his fellow tribesmen took place, something very important occurred. A ritual or a kind of ceremony materialized. The Wampanoags had arrived ritually attired with animal skins and paint. The English had arranged seating on the ground. They had spread out a great green rug with three or four pillows. Drums and trumpets were sounded. Food and drink were served. And then they treated of peace. This peace was maintained for 50 years. Basically, they liked each other. The Plymouthians put their trust in men like Tisquantum, Habamock, and even one of Habamock's wives. More important, Bradford's history has more than one phrase, the Indians said, and it was obvious that the pilgrims were listening. It should be pointed out that during these first years, natives and English lived together inside the town. The biggest myth I suppose we have is that the English were inside the stockade and the Indians were out. No, it wasn't like that. They lived together. They gossiped, they argued, they sued each other in court, and often the Indians won their cases. They behaved as a community, and they were. Despite the fact that the peace did not last, some things did transpire at that meeting, meeting that changed the course of American culture. By the land acknowledgement and the exchange of words taking place at that first meeting, American literature was given form. And descendants of those first people were left with an example to get back to. Yes, there is a city on the hill, but it hasn't been built yet. The Massasoit and Bradford succeeded in accomplishing far more than they knew. They pointed the way to what's possible, and we are grateful. Thank you.